Welcome, Terry Soul here. In this video, I'm going to be using processing, a variant of Java, to be creating a swarm of particles. So these are independent particles that move around on the screen. This is the basis for all sorts of different kinds of programs. For example, if you want to create a game with swarms of enemies, if you want to do an artificial life simulation with swarms of creatures, if you want to do a physics simulation with swarms or at least lots of molecules or atoms, a planetary system with planets orbiting, all of these require the ability to control lots of similar objects. And so this is the basics for how to do that. As is typical in processing, I'm starting with my setup and my draw functions. And then I want to create a class that represents the particles. And so I'm going to do that by creating a new tab. I will call this particles. And then we need to define all of the elements that go into a particle. That is, what does each particle have to know about itself? For example, particles should know their own xy position. And so we can put in the xy position. Particles may need to know, for example, what color they are so that they can draw in their own color. We could add lots of other options here. Maybe particles know their own size, maybe a velocity in the x and y directions. If we were making a game, we might add hit points or health and so forth. So any data that is associated with a particle we put in as part of the class. Then we need a constructor, something that when we create a new particle, when the code is running, builds that new particle in the code. And so a constructor always has the same name as the class, and it sets the initial values. In this case, I'm setting them all to be at random locations. So each new particle that gets created with the constructor will have a random x and y position based on the height and width of the screen. And this is the constructor function. We could also, for example, give them a random color. So I won't add that yet, but we have that as one of the possible variables we can put in later. The other thing that we typically need for any class is some way to see that it's working. So some way to display the particles. So that's what I'm going to create next. A display function, which basically asks each particle to display itself. So for now, I'll just do this as basic circles and pick an arbitrary size. And again, size could be associated with each particle. So instead of them all being of size 15, they could all have a unique size. But for now, we'll just stick with them all being a size 15. And so this display just says, display yourself as a circle. So this is our class. This is the data that is associated with each particle. And now what we need to do is create an array of those particles so that we can display them. Another approach would be to use an array list. Arrays are good when you have a constant size swarm. So I'm just going to have a swarm that's fixed size, which makes arrays useful. If you want a variable size swarm, you'd probably want to use an array list. So I'm going to call my array swarm. My class name was particles. So this is going to be an array of particles called swarm. I should begin with the number of particles in my swarm, or maybe we instead we'll say the size of the swarm. And we'll just begin with 100 for now. So here we're creating the new array. Basically, we're saying I need to reserve enough space to create a hundred objects of type particle. And next, we have to create each of those individual particles by calling the constructor. And so for that, we'll use a for loop. We're creating our new particle. And we're going from 0 to the size of the swarm, which happens to be 100. This will give us 100 particles. And then to have anything interesting happen, we have to display them. And we'll borrow the same for loop. Except in this case, we're taking each of those particles and we're asking it to display itself. And so now we've created the particles and in our draw loop, they're gonna display themselves. 
And if we run this, there we go, 100 particles. They don't do anything of interest yet. They're not moving, they're not different colors, but as promised, 100 circles of size 15. And so the next thing we need to do is decide what to do with them. I'll start with some motion, maybe add some color. If they're moving, we're gonna to have to worry about them wrapping around the screen and so forth. And so we'll add all of that as part of the class. So we go back to our particles class and now to get them to move, we need to add velocity to them, which I suggested we'd need earlier. So I'll just call this X velocity and Y velocity. As soon as we add a new variable, we need to put it into the constructor. So we need to give it a value in the constructor. So we have a random X velocity and Y velocity for each particle. So each particle is gonna have its own random velocity. And now we need those velocities to be applied to the position so that they start moving around pretty typical to call this an update function. So I'll call this update. So we simply update the X and Y position with the velocity. This alone is okay, this will make the particles move, but they're also gonna fly off the edge of the window and disappear, so we have a couple of options. We could have them bounce, or we could have them wrap. Those are the two typical things, or potentially just stop moving. I'm gonna do wrapping, because that's always kind of nice. And so if the particle gets to the right edge of the screen, I want it to wrap around to the left. If it gets to the left, to wrap around to the right, and the same for top and bottom. And so this is a trick to doing that mathematically. So the idea here is I'm using a combination of an addition and a modulus. So the percentage is a modulus, which is divide by and take the remainder. And so imagine a particle that's going off the right edge of the screen. So if my screen width, if we come back here, is 800, if a particle goes off the right edge, that means that its X position exceeds 800. Let's say it's 805. Well, by doing modulus 800, that says divide by 800 and take the remainder. So instead of being at 805, I divide out the 800 and I'm left with five which effectively wrapped it back over to the left side of the screen. So a modulus will wrap if the number is too big. The other thing I have to worry about is a number too, that's too small, which in this case is a negative number. So the left edge of the window is zero, negative three would be off to the left, for example. And so my addition here takes care of that. If I'm my particle is at location negative three, by adding the width, which is 800, I go from negative three to 797, which is exactly three in from the right. And so this ends up automatically wrapping. The addition handles the wrapping for negative numbers too far to the left or too high. The modulus handles numbers that are too large, too far to the right or in processing too low. And so this update now will update the positions of the particles and get them to wrap. So we'll come back over here. And in addition to displaying them, I need to update them. You can do it as part of the same for loop, but it's a good idea to do it separately in case there are other things going on. So here, I'm gonna ask each particle to update itself. So they update their new position and then they display themselves. And the reason I do it as two separate loops, like I said, is if something happens in between, if we were creating a game, for example, where we update their positions and then we check to see if they've attacked each other, we might delete some of them and then we wouldn't want to display them. Good idea to do it as two loops. So here we go. There's our particles and you can see they're all moving around randomly because we gave them random velocities. We have some very slow particles, we have some much faster particles. They don't interact at all. That's not built into the language. There are ways to add interactions, which we're not gonna worry about in this video, but they are moving around nicely. Good. So now the question is, what can we do with this? And the answer is all sorts of things just by updating our class. We can add color, we can add size, we can change how the velocity works, we can change how the display works based on that color and size and so forth.
So one simple thing to do that's sort of interesting is just to go in and turn off the background. So I'll comment that out. And now we have particles that leave a trail, which is kind of cool looking if that's what you like. I'll put the background back in, but it's a nice example of the small changes that you can make that have a big impact on what the code looks like. So let's go in, we have color, let's vary the color of the particles. Before I do that, I'm going to use hue, saturation, and brightness. So I'm going to change my color mode to HSB, which is hue, saturation, brightness, and I'm only going to vary the hue. So in the code here, I'm going to give the particles a random color. That's the hue part, so that's going to be whether it's red or blue or green, and then the other two are saturation and brightness, and I'll just maximize those. And then down here in the display, we will do a fill with that color. So I already have the fill with the color of each particle. So now each particle is going to fill itself in with its given color. And there we go, our nice colorful particles. So the next thing we can do is make them behave more systematically. So instead of just appearing at random locations and moving at random velocities, I'd like a more systematic pattern. And that can be interesting, again, if you're creating, say, a game and you want all the enemies to start in a particular position. Or for this, we'll just make sort of systematic patterns that are more regular. And the idea there is that each particle needs to know where to start based on its number and how to move based on its number. So particle zero will start in a particular location, move at a particular speed, particle one, slightly different location, slightly different speed, and so forth. But if you look at the constructor, particles don't know which number they are to begin with, and so we have to tell them. And so the first part of that is to go into the main code, and when we create new particles, we simply tell them. So we pass their number in as an argument, that immediately gives us an error because over here we have to pick that argument up. And so now when we construct a particle, it knows what its value is. And so what I want to do initially is just as an example is to have them all start in the middle and sort of explode outward. So to start in the middle, I'm going to do the width times 0.5, height times 0.5. So that starts them all in the middle. And then to explode outward, I basically want particle zero to go up, particle one to go at a slight angle, particle two at a slightly larger angle, and so forth, all around the circle. And so what that means is I need to figure out, based on i, what that angle for each particle should be. And it turns out that's i times a scaling factor, which is 2 times pi, processing uses radians, so 2 times pi is a full circle, divided by the size of the swarm. So the first i is 0, the next one over is 2 times pi divided by 100, and so the last one is all the way at the beginning. And then that's the angle, and really because I'm asking for the x value, we think about our trig, the x value is based on the cosine. So we're thinking of this as a triangle. I want to know what is the x value and what is the y value for the velocity. And then I need to give it some initial velocity. I'll say 5 times that. And then I can simply copy this and apply it to the y velocity, except that here I want to use the sine. And now if I run this, they should all start in the center but sort of explode outward. And there we go. Still have random colors, which is a little odd, so we could fix that next and say, well, pick your color based again on i. And so instead of using a random here, I want to do the same sort of scaling, except that in this case, the maximum possible color is 255. So it's going to be my i value times 255. And I'm going to put in a point zero to make sure that I'm dealing with floating points and can get rounding and decimal values, and then I'll just put in the size of the swarm. And so the first color will be zero because i is zero. The second color, or the second hue, will be 255 divided by the size of the swarm, which is 100. So it'll actually be 
and the next one will be what 5.10 and so forth but basically we'll get each color sort of going around the color wheel so if i run this that's exactly what we see and notice it was a little quick but the ring starts looking black that's because we have a little bit of a stroke around each one maybe to see that a bit better i can come over here and increase the size of my swarm let's go to 300 particles and there we go it starts black until they get far enough away away from each other that the black line the stroke around the edge of each one doesn't show up and we could get rid of that if we wanted by going in and saying well when we display them do with no stroke if i could spell that correctly and so now you get that rainbow effect right away which is kind of cool and from here there's lots of things that i sort of encourage you to play with and i'll just show a couple of them we could for example make our circles a lot bigger so i'm increasing the size we get sort of a bigger rainbow and of course it looks like they're bouncing off the edge but really it's reflecting and as they go further and further they start to separate and you can see the actual dots we could go in for example and comment out the background so it's not going to update the background and now as they go they leave a trail behind themselves so you get sort of cool rippling patterns and all sorts of interacting waves if you like that Kind of pattern so lots of opportunities to play we could come in here and for the colors i'm using the full wheel we could adjust this so that you get maybe the colors halfway around and then the same colors repeated or another good example would be instead of sort of exploding outward from the center maybe we want them all falling down so i'll do that as one more final example so in this case if i want them all falling down the screen that means I want them to start at zero in terms of the height. And for the X value, I want them across the screen based on their number, their I. And so I'm going to do the same sort of scaling effect, which is I times the width, but the width represented as a floating point number. So the width is normally an integer. In this case, I think the width is 800. I want to treat it as a decimal. So when I do the division for the scaling, it, I don't lose that decimal value. If you don't do this, it might not fill the whole screen. And then that's again, divided by the size of the swarm. So effectively, this is the scaling value to make sure they all spread out nicely. So that will give me a row across the top. Again, something like a game. This is a row of enemies that are going to charge down at you. If we want them to charge down, then I also have to adjust the velocities so that they're not all flying off in all directions. And I'll start with something very simple. The X velocity is zero and the Y velocity is say five. And so now if we run this, they start at the beginning and we just have a wave moving down the screen. Eh, maybe not as exciting, but from here we can start to sort of change things up if we want a little bit. So we could give them a little bit of an X velocity. Now it's a wave moving down the screen, but also somewhat diagonally. And so the main idea here is that we can use this count for the numbers to control things like where do they start? How do they move? what color are they we could also go back and use that con to control what size they are so some are smaller and some are larger in all sorts of interesting ways one last note i commented out my old velocities rather than deleting them that's always a nice idea when you're sort of experimenting with different patterns in this way you might make a change that you don't like as much and want to go back to an earlier version well now it's very easy just to uncomment this and use it again so I highly encourage you to start with this code and play around with your particles and see what else you can do. In future videos, I'll show some more complicated things, moving into things like the diffusion limited aggregation, for example, and some artificial life where our particles become creatures that can interact with each other. Thank you.